when you say pick up a camera and shoot a movie, you have to understand that means you're crazy. It means you you are you are you start to impress when you pick up that camera and you look through and you start shooting. If something happens like a drug and you gotta keep you gotta keep going until you make your picture. How the am I funny? What the As far back as I can remember, I always wanted to be a gangster. Mom! Take it easy. Lower it. I'm not going to lower it. I have to do this now. I don't mind you playing it, but lower it. If your mother cooks Italian food, why should you go to a restaurant? It was the fall of 42, New York. Here, in a poor neighborhood of Manhattan in Little Italy on Elizabeth Street, there lived a family of second-generation immigrants. Charles and Catherine Scorsese grew up in neighboring houses, with their windows literally facing each other. Their first date was on the fire escape, and they had their wedding on the roof. All their lives, the couple worked at a sewing factory. Catherine started working there at 12 after finishing primary school. Middle school was too expensive for her parents, so they got her a job sewing doll clothes. As for Charles, the whole neighborhood knew about his talent. Show him a suit, and he could recreate it to the last detail. After the wedding, Kat never had to buy a dress because her husband sewed dresses for her. In 1935, Kat and Charlie had their first son, Frank, and on the 17th of November, 1942, their second son, whom they named Martin. The couple realized that the cramped apartment in the concrete slums teeming with criminals was no place to raise children. The minute Catherine was discharged from the hospital, they packed their things and moved to a better neighborhood, where they rented half a house. Marty was a sickly child and was diagnosed with asthma from birth. In the 40s, an inhaler was not enough, and he went to the hospital more often than his peers went to preschool. Nonetheless, Charles's business was growing, and these hardships did not cause panic. Weekly trips to the movie theater and comic store were just a small part of the lucky four-year-old's childhood. His older brother would take him to double features at the nearby theater, and once they convinced their religious mother to let him see a movie not sanctioned by the church. <laughs> Duel in the Sun amazed the young viewer. The music by Dmitry Tiomkin was both terrifying and hypnotizing. Gregory Peck and Jennifer Jones also enchanted him. No, if I'm not good enough to marry, I'm not good enough to kiss. Come here, you. During the finale, the little boy got so scared that he burrowed into his seat and covered his eyes with his hands. But his mother made him open them and yelled, Look at it. You took me here to see it, now watch it. I love you. Oh, don't cry, honey. Don't cry. In 48, Charles was the first of his neighbors to buy a television. This is a 16-inch RCA Victor television set. It's the same kind that my father bought in the late 40s. Life changed forever when the first TV shows and cheap TV movies opened the portal to another world. It was a place with no asthma, allergies, or fits, where the dream of becoming a cowboy seemed real, and imagination was not limited by the law of physics. Father and son shared a love for film, and Charles took him to see Le Drie de Bicyclette and Rome, Open City, films which caused every Italian to reminisce about a homeland he'd never seen. The fairy tale came to an end when in 1948, Charlie's business collapsed. Scorsese had to return to Little Italy. 
The cramped one room belonging to Charles's parents had to house six for half a year until they could find their own cramped one room. Movie theaters were replaced with the third floor window of their house, while the landscape below was more terrifying than the finale of Duel in the Sun. I certainly wasn't able to get it when I was a kid growing up on the Lower East Side. It was very hard at the time for me to balance what I really believed was the right way to live with the violence I saw all around me. I saw too much of it among the people I knew. Martin was not allowed to go outside. It was no place for healthy children, not to mention a weak and sickly boy. His world perspective was shaped by his window and the TV screen. He diverted himself by transporting the scenes he saw on TV to paper, and even dreamed of becoming an artist. In the future, these little sketches would become film storyboards, and his attention to detail would help him fill the library of his cinema-loving mind with the plots and names of every film he watched. But years passed, and he started going to school so he could no longer hide in front of the TV screen. The mean streets began to leave their mark on his upbringing. There were two languages of power on Elizabeth Street, the Mafia and the Church. The priests were the only ones the Mafia submitted to. Martin found his chance at a spotless career where there was no place for fear. The frail young man, nothing like the future Carlo Gambino, decided to dedicate his life to faith. In 1951, he had his first communion and started studying at a Catholic school, where for the next five years he would dream of the priesthood. He served in St. Patrick's Church and later even attended a seminary high school. There was room for his first love in his new world. A priest helped the boys to analyze films from I Confess by Alfred Hitchcock I confess to Almighty God and to you, Father, that I have sinned. to On the Waterfront, directed by Elia Kazan. Well, I thought there'd be more of you here, but... At school, they studied ideas, dissected problems, and found biblical motifs in the plots. You're in the church if I need you. Did you ever hear of a saint hiding in a church? The youth was moving in the right direction, but puberty forced him to look at the world from a different perspective. Sex, drugs, and rock and roll infiltrated his life in the reverse order. But even the music was enough to change his plans. Up until he finished middle school, he was still thinking about the church, but his dreams changed from the moment in 1959 when he got his hands on his friend's 8mm camera. In a day, he drew a storyboard for his future reel about ancient Rome, climbed onto a roof with his friends where they put on bedsheets, and filmed the short Vesuvius 6. Unfortunately, only drawings are left of this epic story. The director only had to watch it once to realize this might not be allowed to see the light of day, and that he needed a drastic change in his life. I don't really see a conflict between the church and the movies, the sacred and the profane. There are major differences, but I could also see great similarities. Both are places for people to come together and share. Charles and Catherine dreamed of a better life for their sons, but their low income did not stand in the way of paying for Martin's education at NYU. The new world amazed him, before he was surrounded by poverty and violence, and now by happy classmates from wealthy families who loved cinema and admired him. For the white-collared kids, he represented a mysterious and brutal world which they usually only saw in movies. As for the library of pictures, scenes, and quotes, which Score says he could recall at a moment's notice, they put a spell on his teachers. His professor from the Cinematic Arts Department, Hag Manugan, turned into his greatest fan and the feeling was mutual. Within the walls of the university, European neorealism was worshipped and Truffaut and Godard were like the gods. Si vous n'aimez pas la ville, allez vous faire foutre. Manugan expected that his students would make films about what they knew best, about themselves. He ordered them to grab their cameras and walk the streets to document real life. But school was no walk in the park. 
as he was the only student who couldn't afford even an amateur camera like the 8mm Kodak M2. While his classmates were filming every day working towards their films, Martin had to be content with one or two days a month when he was able to borrow a camera from his friends. But even in these short deadlines, Scorsese was able to create masterpieces. He was on a whole other level from the rest of us. He could quote films to you, describe them shot by shot. While we were hopping around trying to find the right exposure, he was making these little gems. And the room was nice. All I needed was a little fixing up, so I fixed it up. While working on the first short film of his career, he met the editor-director Thelma Schoenmacher, who saved his work from the clumsy attempts at cutting his film himself. Even my friends began to notice in me that there seemed to be something amiss. You know, Harry, there seems to be something amiss. The real What's a Nice Girl Like You Doing in a Place Like This was not only his debut, but the beginning of a lifelong friendship. I have a vivid imagination. Even my friends say it. You know, Harry, you got a vivid imagination. His second school project was the crime comedy short called It's Not Just You, Murray. But then again, you know, in his life, you only got so much luck. The main character, a man who badly wanted to be a gangster, would lay the foundation for the characters in Mean Streets, Goodfellas, and Casino. And then you can give him all he deserves. The drama received an award for the best student film from the Producers Guild and brought him his first moment of glory. Also, while he was filming, he met the young actress Lorraine Marie Brennan, who was also studying at NYU. In 1965, Marty got married, and a year later celebrated the birth of their daughter. Their daughter was named Catherine, in honor of her grandmother. Life was good, especially since Paramount Studios offered the rising star a paid summer internship. He was already packing his suitcase when he received an apology letter. The studio was changing its policy and no longer required his services. So, as you do when you have a wife and a baby and a bunch of bills with no prospects, you make a feature film. While at a summer internship with his classmate Michael Wadley, who became his cameraman, Martin began making a melodrama based on his own 33-page script. They invited Harvey Keitel to play the main role, who was an amateur stage actor at the time who worked as a stenographer at a courthouse. Well, I am, as they say, um, uh, at the moment, sort of in between, uh, at this time, sort of in between positions. The director's father went to the bank and took out $6,000, becoming the first investor in his son's career. The money was spent on film reel and buying other small items since there was no official budget. Wadley was the only one with a car, so he transported all of the equipment while the director, actors, and film crew had to make their way to the locations on foot or by bus. They filmed only on the weekends wherever they were able to, whether at the Scorsese's, at the local church, or at the director's grandmother's house. Since these locations were not intended for filming after the lights and cameras were installed, there was hardly any space for the actors to act. When they tried to film outside, they were usually interrupted by aggressive homeless people or curious children. It was all stopping and staring. They started shooting a scene, then two months later, you wanted a reshoot. The actors had to cut their hair or had another job and couldn't work. It was a nightmare. The first draft was finished just in time to premiere at the New York Film Festival in 65. The audience didn't quite get the hour-long melodrama called Bring on the Dancing Girls, but the director of the festival saw the potential and wrote a letter to Professor Haig Manugan asking him to help his student remake the film. Haig responded by finding a sponsor among the students in the directing department, Joseph Vale. The successful lawyer considered film his hobby and had no problem investing $37,000 into the picture. Manugan and Scorsese went to the editing room and left only the best scenes. Haig convinced the director to rewrite the script, escalate the conflict as well as come up with a resolution. The new text took Martin six months to write. During that time, he got a job at the CBS TV channel where he edited news clips. This is the CBS Evening News with Walter Cronkite and Charles Kuralt in the CBS Newsroom in New York. And also made a documentary commissioned by the United States Informational Agency 
called New York City Melting Point. In the winter of 1966, the director resumed filming the drama, which was renamed I Call First. Oh, right? She was like, call first. You can't call first. Who you call? Martin was able to get both Michael Wadley and Harvey Keitel back in the project, who hadn't gotten his hopes up very high anyways. A year and a half of the film had exhausted him. He had a tendency to show up with a new haircut one day and the next forget his costume. It just doesn't seem real, does it? It just doesn't make any sense. But Scorsese turned a blind eye to these things, partially because he respected Keitel's talent and partially because he knew that changing the main character would kill his picture. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> it took three months to film the second version and the reel was finished by the summer of 67. Yeah, that was some picture. Some picture. It premiered at the Chicago Film Festival, but the director didn't attend. Not in protest or because of the conflict with the producer. Martin just didn't have enough money for a bus ticket to Chicago. His budget had grown, but he still did not have enough and his debts grew in proportion with the amount of material he filmed. When, after the showing, they offered the young director a chance to release the film in limited theaters, he felt like he was on top of the world. He rejoiced until he found out that without buying the rights to the music, the reel couldn't be shown in any commercial theater. After two weeks of haunting the music labels, he was granted only two of the ten tracks. This destroyed his dream of packed theaters. But then his friend came to him with an unusual request. In two weeks, the thriller The Honeymoon Killers was supposed to start shooting in New York. The producers had a script, actors, and a budget but lacked only a director. I met with uh, Martin Scorsese, and uh, he loved the script, and uh, we were in business. Scorsese accepted immediately and went on to create the visual style for the reel and think through every frame. However, his bursts of creativity and obsession with French directors drove his bosses crazy within the first week. I realized the way he was doing it that, well, we had $150,000 and we had seven weeks and that we would never, ever get through. For the first six days, he professed his belief in natural film and shot every scene in one take. He's so gone. On the seventh day, the cameraman Oliver Wood spent 50 takes trying to catch a can of beer falling onto the pavement. But the scene did not make the final cut because that evening, Scorsese was fired for the first and last time. The producer was not happy at all. Uh, Martin wasn't happy and so he left after a week. His assistant, Donald Volkman, was promoted and he finished filming. This indie production became a cult film and received positive reviews from Francois Truffaut, who called it his favorite American film. In addition, the popular video rental store, Blockbuster, included it in its top 100 films of all time. Well, it doesn't look too bad. I'll just have to get used to it, I guess. Those who were close to the film knew that Scorsese's ideas and drawings were used for the film, but the director left without making a scene. As for Volkman and his producers, The Honeymoon Killers was the last film of their career. And I'm the one who should be angry. Martin's anger and disillusionment were reflected in his next cutting social commentary short, The Big Shave, which amazed New York's Beaumont and enchanted critics. I've blown around the world the short fit in everything from metaphors about the war in Vietnam to high levels of nihilism into five minutes. After an unsuccessful period in 1969, Manugan got Scorsese a job as his personal assistant at the university. For a whole year, he was busy with stable and most importantly, a paying job. In that year, he oversaw students like Jonathan Kaplan and Oliver Stone. The university sent him to Europe to attend some of the main film festivals of 1969. Thanks to this trip, he made a few acquaintances in Amsterdam. He was approached by the exploitation films distributor, Joseph Renner. Joe offered to take care of the song rights for his film and release I Call First in hundreds of theaters. I don't believe you. <laughs> I wouldn't lie to you. <laughs> the only condition was that he add an erotic nude scene which would help advertise it and turn it into a sexploitation film. Martin immediately brought Keitel to the Dutch capital, where two days later, 
In a cramped room, he paid for the time of a dozen free-spirited women and shot the needed scene, combining it with the door song, The End. Ten years later, this impromptu scene would serve as the inspiration for the opening frames of Apocalypse Now. Brenner was amazed by what he saw, and he also changed the title to Who's That Knocking at My Door, in honor of the first lines of the song, Who's That Knocking by the Genies. Under this title, the picture took the drive-in movies by storm, where it made its first profit. Good. That picture was great. In 1969, a journalist from Time magazine, Jay Cox, was researching talented young directors from New York and became interested in Scorsese. Martin charmed Cox, who as a result helped him to get into closed premieres, film festivals, and even convinced the famous American director John Cassavetes to take a look at his friend's debut reel. Who is that knocking at my door? Amazed Cassavetes. This movie is as good as Citizen Kane. This review left Scorsese speechless. He couldn't believe his ears. This great director, basically his idol, was saying these things about his film. This meeting gifted Scorsese with yet another friend. While Martin was fighting for the release of his debut picture, Michael Wadley founded the film company Paradigm Pictures and gathered some of his NYU classmates under one roof. The main editor became Thelma Schumacher. Paradigm's main focus was modern documentaries and television shows. Scorsese was often invited to work on various jobs. The company gave him a chance to direct an episode of The Monkees, a popular TV show about the adventures of a rock and roll band which often featured amateur directors. Later that year, Wadley took on the biggest project of his career, the documentary Woodstock. He headed up a film crew of 15 people, which was an impossible task for one person. This is why he asked Thelma to be his assistant director and Martin to take charge of some of the cameramen and film extra material. On the morning of the 15th of August, 1969, Scorsese and Schumacher got into his old white Corvette and set off for Wallkill to one of the biggest rock festivals in America. This job was a nightmare for a young man who rarely left the boundaries of Queens. In three days, Mills Park was visited by over half a million people. They faced unsanitary conditions, drugs, and the unrelenting wave of decibels which made Martin drop the walkie-talkies and spend 72 hours yelling to his cameraman over the greatest musicians on the planet. At one point, Marty tried to take a nap in a pup tent under the stage. He knocked over the pole and the whole thing collapsed. He had claustrophobia and was screaming for somebody to help him. But he wasn't Martin Scorsese yet, he was just some schmuck from Little Italy. On Monday morning, the 19th of August, Jimi Hendrix appeared on the stage after his performance had been delayed 10 hours. He played a set in front of the remaining audience, and it was a fitting finale which had given the world a weekend of sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Having returned to New York, the team realized that it had filmed over 120 miles of material. Wadley asked Martin and Thelma to help edit. It took four grueling months to make a three-hour film, with the director's cut being an extra 50 minutes. Its first screening won the critics over. Wadley was able to show what it was like to be at Woodstock. A half a million young people can get together and have three days of fun and music and have nothing but fun and music, and I God bless you for it! The rights to release and distributions were immediately acquired by Warner Brothers. Michael sold the rights for $600,000, and over the next two months, Woodstock brought the studio over $50 million. 
Success followed all who were connected to the project. Wadley got an Oscar for Best Documentary, and Thelma Schoonmacher was nominated for Best Editing. And though Scorsese was left out of his friend's glory, Warner had an even better surprise for him. I look for a thematic idea running through my movies, and I see that it's the outsider struggling for recognition. I realize that all my life I've been an outsider, and above all, being lonely, but never realizing it. Riding the wave of Woodstock's success, Warner Brothers invested money into a similar project. Producer Fred Weintraub, who had purchased Wadley's reel for Warner, wanted to make money off of every festival in the U.S. A month after the picture's release, Fred hired director Francois Reichenbach to make the documentary Medicine Ball Caravan, which depicted the traveling festival caravan of love, which was nicknamed Woodstock on Wheels. The film crew traveled 8,000 miles with the musicians and recorded the performance of B.B. King and Alice Cooper, hundreds of cities, and dozens of concerts. However, after three months of editing, the pre-screening mortified Weintraub. The screening lasted nine hours, though the plot gets lost after the first ten minutes. The next day, Warner fired Reichenbach and his team. Someone at the studio suggested that the producer ask Scorsese for help, and Fred called him out to Los Angeles. His two-week contract stretched out for six months. Martin cut the time down to a ninth of the original and was able to combine the material in a new way. The result satisfied Weintraub, but the film was still a flop. Martin didn't want to return to New York since California was the place where films were made. He decided to stay in LA even though it meant shipwrecking his marriage. Lorraine was not about to move to the other side of the country with a child in tow. Scorsese was brought up strictly Catholic, so when he left his family, he knew he was committing a terrible deed. However, he was not able to betray his first love, cinema, and left Lorraine and Catherine forever. The world of cinema did not receive Martin with open arms. Adult life was hard for the director. After working on Medicine Ball Caravan, he wandered Hollywood aimlessly, and John Cassavetes got him a job as a sound editor for the melodrama Minnie and Moskowitz. You're a funny guy. I don't think of myself as funny. That's why I'm funny. I mean, if you think of yourself as funny, you become tragic. $500 a week and a place to sleep on set were the best conditions he could have been offered in Los Angeles. Besides Cassavetes, in LA, he only knew Brian De Palma. The directors were introduced to each other in 1965, became friends, and from time to time hung out at different studios, festivals, and parties in Beverly Hills which were held by their more successful colleagues. During one of these events at Fred Weintraub's house, he met the producer's daughter, Sandy. The girl was just as obsessed with film and took him to double and triple features and seemed to know even more about the movies than him. The couple lived together for the next four years. In the autumn of 1970, Sandy, Brian, and Martin went to a film festival in Sereno. It was another lame attempt to network with one exception. It actually turned out to be successful. Scorsese was introduced to Francis Ford Coppola. On the first night, they dueled using their knowledge of cinema and rock music instead of bullets or swords. Those who saw them together that night thought that they were brothers. The tall, moody, bearded Coppola and next to him a minimized copy, the lean Scorsese. Coppola got a deal for the adaptation of The Godfather and went to New York to research. Martin volunteered to help. Francis agreed and happily ate pasta at Scorsese's parents' house in Little Italy, and in order to improve the accents used in the film, taped Charles Scorsese speaking while Martin's mother gave him advice about choosing actors and tried to convince Coppola that there was no way he could film the picture in 100 days. Martin took him to Elizabeth Street, showed him around Little Italy, and even helped choose some of the key locations. A few months later, he was a regular guest on Coppola's set. At the same time, his success in documentary film attracted the attention of producers, and he was entrusted with the editing of yet another musical documentary. Elvis on tour showed the American King of Pop perform, as well as showed behind-the-scenes footage and provided a short biography of Presley's life. Oh. 
Easy, easy, easy. Good show. Good show. For over a year, Martin couldn't get work in the movie business. He obviously hadn't thought through his move to L.A. and had been following a naive dream. When Cassavetti's assistant received a call with the request to find Scorsese because Roger Corman wanted him to direct his next film, he was answered with a laugh and a dial tone. However, the proposal turned out to be real. The famous exploitation film producer truly wanted to meet Martin, and three days later he was already sitting in the office of New World Pictures. Corman had gone to a repeat showing of Who's That Knocking at My Door, at Coppola's insistence with whom he had made horror films in the early 60s. Roger was impressed with the young director's talent, and he decided to give the young man a shot. For a year, he had been planning to film the sequel to his favorite work, the crime drama Bloody Mama, where Shelley Winters shone next to a young Bruce Dern and Robert De Niro. My eyes have seen the glory. <laughs> Hallelujah! Hallelujah! Roger offered him Barbara Hershey and David Carradine for the main roles, a budget of $600,000, and 24 full filming days with complete artistic freedom with the screenplay called Boxcar Bertha, on one condition, that there be nude scenes, explosions, or violence at least every 15 pages. Scorsese didn't waste any time, and in two weeks incited Corman to a presentation of his adaptation of the text, the producer expected to come to a read-through of the script, but Martin was so afraid of repeating his mistakes from Honeymoon Killers that he had already planned most of the scenes. For the first, but not the last time, Roger did not regret his choice and only added the classic B-movie rule. The film should have a shocking opening and a bloody finale. November of 1971 was the best in Martin's life to date. After eight years of trying to get into the exclusive film society, he now found himself at its very heart. Grabbing something good when it comes by. Working with the professional film crew brought him back to his college days. The cinematographer Paul Rapp showed him how to light the scene, shoot in one direction, and then change the position of the equipment. The team had spent years honing its filming skills in low-budget films and offered the director the most important lessons of his career. It's gonna be all right. Sure. In addition to Hershey and Carradine teaching him how to work with the actors. Scrupulous preparation allowed Martin to experiment on set and he delved into the world of improvisation. If you want to leave, there's no chains on you, honey. You dumb. The erotic scenes were especially successful. The year before, Barbara and David had gotten married, so the camera didn't interfere with their displays of affection. Scorsese milked the typical grindhouse plot for all it was worth. In January of the next year, he finished the first draft and set up a private viewing for John Cassavetes. Marty, you've just spent a whole year of your life making a piece of shit. It's a good picture, but you're better than the people who make this kind of movie. Don't get hooked into the exploitation market. Just try and do something different. Oh. Hey, do you like our work? Let us know with your like and comment. Push that subscribe button and share with your friends. If you want to support the project financially, become our sponsor on Patreon or YouTube sponsorship. Thank you.